gonna we're going down the uh, uh, you just heard two magnificent talks um, and this one's not gonna quite live up to it among other things uh, you know as far as I ever rose in the uh, religious hierarchy was a Sunday school teacher in my little Methodist church so uh, um, it was so great to hear from Reverend Yearwood and the Hip Hop Caucus who have been the best allies from the beginning of all this kind of work. So amazing. And it is exactly the alliance that we need to build. The other day when Ben Jealous, the head of the NAACP, came out to speak with everybody who was training to get arrested on Thursday night, which was a wonderful, wonderful moment. Uh, he and I were talking about a, a piece of writing that Reverend Yearwood and I did a few years ago. And we asked the kind of weird question in it, what was the greatest environmental um, song of all time, the one that reached the most people? And we decided in that piece that it really wasn't anything by uh, John Denver or even Pete Seeger, that it almost certainly was Marvin, Mar Marvin Gaye with Mercy, Mercy Me and the Ecology Song in 1971. And that was a moment when there was absolutely no division between different movements and different peoples. And that's the thing that we're bringing back here. And it's been happening since day one of this thing when, when Dan Choi, the head of the kind of don't ask, don't tell reform movement went bravely to prison with us. And it's been happening as convoys of landowners from Nebraska and Texas and farmers and ranchers have been rolling in day after day after day to go to jail in the big city. And it's been happening as the religious community has responded in unbelievable form. Um, we have been uh, uh, well prayed over and well blessed from every possible direction in the last couple of weeks. And uh, it seems to have worked, I must say. Um, things have gone unbelievably well. There are 243 people, I think, getting arrested right now. That brings, by unofficial count, to 1,252 people who've been handcuffed and hauled away in the last two weeks. That is the biggest civil disobedience action in this century in this country. And it's an unlikely one in a way because this is not an issue that most of us have been focused on for a long time. We should have been. We've heard the last couple of days unbelievably eloquent and beautiful testimony from our friends in the Native, <coughs> Native American and Canadian communities who've been living with the um, damage from this tar sands for years, whose ancestral lands have been wrecked and pillaged in all this, and it's been amazing. The very people who've been carrying this fight from the beginning are the very first were the indigenous environmental community. The very first people we called were Tom Goldtooth, who's over there from the Indigenous Environmental Network. One of our, one of our great, great, great leaders. And he has assembled a crew of great, great, great leaders from around the country. I saw today that Chief Bill Erasmus from the Dene and Northwest Territories had canceled his early flight to make sure he could still be here with us today, and that's amazing to see. And it is their work that we've come to late, but I hope not too late, and that's what I want to talk with you about for just a minute. Um, uh, there's going to be lots more going on here today, and the 
quality of the speaking will be rising again in a minute and it'll rise to a crescendo at the end when Naomi Klein will get up and tell us what's what as she often does but 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 before before I stop um, I just want to talk for a minute about what's coming now I wish that I could tell you all that it was time to go take a rest uh, for a few weeks because y'all worked hard and no one's worked harder than the amazing people who've organized these uh, uh, arrests day after day after day. So I wish I could tell you that you could stop, but you can't. We have laid the groundwork successfully here over two weeks. This has been phase one. Here's what's happened in phase one. What had been a regional issue is now a national issue. Not only that, it's become completely clear that it is the focus of environmental energy and focus between now and the election. The, the heads of all the major environmental groups, three days into this protest, I think after they watched uh, the wonderful, wonderful Gus Speth, I, I just can tell you that story for a minute, because he went to jail with us that first day. Gus is 70. He is, was, for many years, the epitome of the establishment environmentalist, doing all the things that you were supposed to do. He ran the Council on Environmental Quality under President Carter. He ran the United Nations Development Program. He did everything that it was possible to do, and he began to understand that it wasn't working fast enough. When he was in jail, he managed to smuggle a note out through his lawyer to the press that just said, I've held a lot of important positions in this town, but none as important as the one I'm in right now. And that, that was a good thing. And I think that his witness helped, helped, helped make sure that our brothers and sisters across the environmental movement who are not always completely great about getting on exactly the same page you may have noticed you get different envelopes from different ones of them from time to time in the mail but they are absolutely on the same page now they signed a letter three days into this and it said all of them, from the pretty corporate friendly environmental defense fund to the corporate unfriendly rainforest action network, they said there is not an inch of daylight between us and the protesters out there getting arrested in front of your house. They said, of President Obama, we expect nothing less than that you will block this pipeline. Now, so we have established it is a national issue and we have managed to make it clear to everyone that President Obama is on the hook for it, that he and he alone will make this call one way or another without our nutty Congress in the way. For once, there's nobody either getting in his way or giving him an excuse, okay? It's on him. So that's what we've established so far. It doesn't mean that we've won anything yet. As yesterday's really shameful decision about ozone showed us, the odds are still much against us. Okay, the odds are still in the favor of those guys in that building over there at the US Chamber of Commerce and their friends in the oil industry. They've got more money. Uh, uh, Reverend Ear, would you correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the oil industry has more money than God, perhaps, <laughs> on them. Um, and, and <laughs> what that means is we're going to keep having to find alternate currencies in which to work. For the last two weeks, those currencies have been our bodies. Yeah. And we'll continue to do some of that, okay? We need you to circle October 7th on your calendar, all right? 
There's going to be a big, the big final culminating hearing on this thing in Washington on October 7th, and we're going to need a lot of people there. But we're also going to have to do other things, figure out other creative ways to behave. We've got some pretty good ideas. You're going to be finding out about them in the next 48 hours from tarsandsaction.org. If you're not signed up there with your name so we can be in communication, make sure you are, all right? Many of those ideas are going to focus around trying to hold President Obama to the standard he set in 2008. When he said the night he was nominated, when he said the night he was nominated, in my presidency, the rise of the oceans will begin to slow and the planet will begin to heal. You should not say things like that if you do not mean it because people yeah. believe you. Yeah. And here's the thing. Here is the thing. Here is the thing. We are not going to do President Obama the favor of attacking him. All right? That's what they want to have a sort of noisy, marginalized group of people on the fringe who are angry and attacking them. That's not what we're going to do. What we're going to do is figure out ways to hold that campaign accountable to the standard that they set in 2008. We, we got some quite amazing quite amazing homemade video in yesterday from our friends in Seattle. And 40 or 50 of them had gone into the Obama, newly opened Obama campaign office there. And politely but firmly, they were explaining to its director a few home truths. There was an older woman who said, you know what, I'm from Congressional District 51, Precinct 20, I can't remember what it was. She's, we, we went for Obama uh, 53, 47, I knocked on 174 doors. We got to tell you, you need to keep your promises if it's going to happen again, all right? The, the, the problem, if Obama was just doing these things and he told us he was going to do them, then no problem we would have no reason to complain. It would still be warming the temperature, you know, raising the temperature, the climate, and do it, but we wouldn't be in a position of moral strength, but we are in a position of moral strength because they are not doing what they said they were going to do. So that's going to be a kind of tricky line to walk. But we've been walking it for two weeks because people have been a arrested day after day after day outside Barack Obama's White House, but they've done it without anger and without hatred and without bitterness and just with steady, determined resolve, all right? Resolve is an important word. It was the word that Tim DeChristopher used at the end of his sentencing. He said, we go forward with joy and resolve. We had word from Tim the other day in jail in California. Those who don't know, Tim is one of our brave colleagues who's in prison for two years in federal prison for civil disobedience action he did completely peacefully and nonviolently, even less disruptive than what we're doing. But he's in prison for two years, and he sent word that, well, he sent word, first of all, that he'd stayed up late one night in prison to watch the TV news, and one of the items on the TV news was all of us getting arrested, and it sent a great wave of pleasure through him. And so he just sent out word to keep that resolve going. And we will. The, um, the fact is that as people have gotten arrested day after day after day, some, I mean, at some level, it's hard almost not to take it for, just take it a little for granted that this is, you know, that, I mean, I get up every day and walk down here and there's another 150, 200 brave soul. 
What people have done these last two weeks is not ordinary. It is very, very hard for normal law-abiding Americans to go and do something they're not supposed to do and get their hands cuffed behind their back and put in a wagon and hauled away. It goes against the grain and it's taken courage and bravery and now it's going to take that same kind of courage and bravery going forward. It won't all be in one central place. We're going to have to fan out around the country and make sure it happens. But it will happen. I don't know whether we're going to win this fight or lose this fight, but I know that we are going to make this fight and what an honor it is to get to make it with you all. Thank you so much.